coming up next on Arizona Horizon. We'll have results and analysis of the major races in yesterday's Arizona primary election. An election overview next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump is in Phoenix tonight to make what is expected to be a policy address on illegal immigration. The rally is at the Phoenix Convention Center and is scheduled to include introductory speeches by Governor Doug Ducey and Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Earlier today, Trump made a last-minute trip to Mexico, meeting privately with Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto. Trump said the two men found agreement on ending illegal immigration, dismantling drug cartels, and improving trade deals. As for Nieto, the Mexican president said, quote, Mexican people have been hurt by the comments that have been made, but I'm sure a genuine interest to build a relationship will give both of our countries better welfare. Trump closed his prepared remarks by describing the meeting as a, quote, tremendous honor and that he considers the Mexican president a friend. Yesterday's primary election in Arizona is for the most part in the books with big wins for John McCain and Joe Arpaio and what could be a loss for longtime county recorder Helen Purcell. I thank you all. I thank my wife Cindy and our children. You know, campaigns can be as hard on the candidates' families as they are on the candidates. And we've been through a few of them together. This one has a ways to go yet, and it's not going to get any easier. Well, naturally, you can't make everybody happy. So you do get detractors every time you run. But I've been very uh, fortunate that people keep supporting me. This has been uh, a different kind of a year for me. Uh, some of it has been disappointing, um, and I've, we've made some mistakes. But I think we've learned greatly from those mistakes. I don't like being defined by one mistake that I made. I know I made that mistake, and we've corrected it, and we've gone on from there. Joining us now to offer insight and analysis of last night's vote and what it means for the general election in November, our political consultant Stan Barnes, president of Copper State Consulting Group, and from the campaign consulting group Havelina, we welcome David Wade. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Good us. Good to be here. Stan, having. biggest surprise of yesterday's vote. Uh, if you take all of it together, the biggest surprise for me was that Paul Babu won so handily, dispensed with uh, some good candidates, and some he carried some real difficult uh, political baggage across the finish line and is set up pretty well now uh, for his big race in November. I think that was the big surprise. I want to get to that race in a little bit, but you, big surprise, David. What, what do you got? Uh, I'm going to go macro. I think that my big surprise is the low turnout of this race. It's been, it was much lower turnout than we had in either 2014 or 2012, and I think that there's sort of an, a, uh, an enthusiasm gap that we may be seeing affecting things in November as 24%, well. 24%, something like that? 24% was the turnout uh, this year. Uh, two years ago it was 27, the year before, or the cycle before that it was 28, so we're actually significantly off of where uh, the sort of standard is. What's up with that? I mean, we, we, this is supposed to be the big year. Everyone's you, supposed to be interested. You, you making news, making a point there. I, I'm not really sure how to explain it. I think the opposite's going to be true for what it's worth in the general election. I think we're going to have record turnout. I can't really explain what happened in the, the, the primary, though. All right, let's get to some of these races in particular. John McCain and Kelly Ward, the Republican primary for U.S. Senate. Uh, this was not expected to be close. It really wasn't close. Was it closer than you thought it would be? No, it really wasn't closer than I thought it would be. It's uh, Kelly Ward ran a pretty good campaign. She had some money. She had an independent expenditure. John McCain is not loved by everybody that turns out in a primary, an Arizona Republican primary, but he carried the day. Uh, there were other two other people on the ballot as well. As another reason he only got 52% is that the, the vote had place to go if it didn't want to be with McCain or Ward. So I, I think he should be happy with his setup in the primary. Now, the general is a real race for him, a real race for him, and that's going to be a whole nother matter. I was going to say, uh, what do those numbers suggest for John McCain uh, going up against Ann Kirkpatrick, because a lot of folks see that as pretty tight. Uh, the latest poll, the numbers we saw, though, didn't look all that close. Yeah, that, uh, in fact, the vast majority of uh, the polling has actually shown it to be a very tight race. One poll has shown it. It's been an outlier, basically. So I think, it, you know, I unless you see a second poll that sort of confirms that, I pretty much put that one on the, the trash heap. Uh, I think that it's likely, in fact, I think, 
we are in a dead heat that we're looking at this. And I would say it's it's related to this um, this turnout, that enthusiasm piece. I actually do feel like that's a little bit of an alarm bell if I were John McCain. And you know, after 33 years representing the state of Arizona, he got just a little over 50 percent of the Republican voters to vote for him. I think that's also an alarm bell. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I feel this just sort of goes to, you know, I'm not, you know, proclaiming the end of John McCain, but I will say I think this is the beginning of a very, very tight race. You agree? I do agree. He's going to spend a lot of money, and uh, Anchor Patrick has the resources to match that. And everyone, every political consultant in the world is trying to figure out who's actually going to show up and vote to the main point here. And, and that could be a different voter, given Hillary Clinton at the top of one ticket and Donald Trump at the other. Interesting. Uh, Congressional District 5, uh, this was a very uh, noisy race with a lot of familiar names, a lot of familiar folks in here. We had a debate on this set among most of the candidates. Uh, Christine, Stan, Christine Jones, is she's going to win this thing. And she, I believe she is going to win it, and I think we're going to, I think we are witnessing the birth of a Republican popular star, if you will. I mean, I, I hate to pox her with that. But she's in a very safe congressional district that she could hold for the rest of her life if she wanted. But if you haven't met her, she is engaging and smart, and her commercials were excellent. She ran a great campaign, um, and she she did it while not living in the district, which you know is it, while at once kind of mysterious. But you got to give her props. She did said, "I'm not moving." And the lines may move, but yeah. I'm not going to move. And she, she had the resources to tell her story. David, does she win in two years if only one of those candidates decides to challenge her? I think that's really kind of the story that comes out of this for me, from my perspective. I mean, I feel like, you know, this she won with, you know, a, a fraction of the uh, primary voters and a three-way split among um, LDS candidates. Um, I think if the if that community ends up backing one candidate and she ends up on a one on one, that's a that's a tough race. For would her. that would that happen though? Would 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 there be anyone of those three or someone else out there who's pretty popular decide? You know, maybe Christine Jones isn't for us. I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, my my guess is that uh, I haven't talked to Andy Biggs, but I'm guessing he's already thinking about that very thing. Really, that very phenomenon that David just pointed out. The the LDS vote, uh, that vote constituency in the Republican primary in the East Valley is, is easily a double digit number. It's, an, it's a very enthusiastic number, very homogeneous number. And there are three LDS candidates that split that constituency. Uh, uh, and Matt Salmon. I mean, Matt Salmon was anointed Biggs. I mean, his resignation, now, what happened? Well, I, well, endorsements don't mean that much. We keep saying that on this show every two years. I tell you that. <laughs> I keep asking what happened. And, and, and and endorsements don't really mean that much. Uh, and, and so that's, that's one thing. It wasn't that big a deal to begin with. What happened was one candidate, who was a good candidate, four great candidates out there, all four of them, one had the resources at which to actually permeate the, the voting base, and the other three did not. Advertising in this was hot and heavy. Did that make a big difference? Oh, for sure. Absolutely, yeah, and I think that her ability to be up early and really define herself and, uh, you know, uh, create a brand in that district, I think, was a huge help. And, you know, she was, again, uh, she didn't need to win in a four-way race. She needed to win with 50 percent. She needed what she got. Andy Biggs, Don Stapley, Justin Olson, these are people who have been around a while. They have name recognition. They have been very much involved in politics. Will they continue to be involved? I believe uh, you can say the answer is yes to all three of them. And I know it's true of people like Justin Olson, who, who is young and has a, had a bright future, still has a bright future in spite of this loss. All right, Congressional District 1, uh, Paul Babu wins. Uh, it wasn't really all that close. And uh, I don't know, I, 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 for whatever reason, again, we're looking at 32 percent winning though, there, David. Now, again, another thing, a lot of folks in the race, a lot of votes split up. He wins with 32, but he wins handily. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this? Well, I think he started off, I honestly expected him to win. And I, 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 he has some name ID that he started with that I think was really very important to him in that race. Um, and yeah, people were, you know, working to... Uh, share with voters all the sort of the baggage that's been talked about. You know, one of the things that I find remarkable is that when former Speaker David Gowan uh, dropped out of the race, he said, Babu is unelectable in a general election. Uh, and I think that's true. Uh, it is surprising that he was electable in a primary. And I want to get to the Democrats in a second here, but these are the folks that didn't even finish in the money, Stan. We're looking at Ken Bennett 
and David Gowan. We're looking at a couple of leaders of the legislature here in recent years. Why aren't they not? What's going on? Yeah. Ken Bennett especially. Gowan dropped out. But what's going on? No, I, my, my general theory, and this seems to be proven every time we get a legislator wanting to run for Congress, is that the legislative base of which you're jumping off of isn't that high. Um, in fact, it might even be a negative because what you've got is a, is a history of voting on a lot of issues that could all be used against you. Right. It was used against Gowan, used against Bennett. It's, it was used against Kirk Adams when he ran for Congress. I mean, so at, these two guys are both good guys and the latest two legislative leaders, one was the Senate president, one was the Speaker of the House, yes. who thought they could convert that, but it doesn't convert one for one. Even Andy Biggs, who's the sitting Senate president, couldn't convert it right now. Interesting. So now the Democratic side, uh, it looks like uh, that one was it, it kind of a, not too much of a surprise there. Right. Uh, as, as far as, uh, I think, a district, do we have district, uh, no, I'm talking, sorry, about, talking about district two here. Sorry, throwing up all over myself here. <laughs> Matt Hines edges Victoria Steele in district two. Was, th was that expected? I expected it. Um, I, I think that the, um, you know, Victoria Steele ran a great race. I, I think that the, the two candidates, one of the things that I have to say was, you know, as a Democrat makes me a little proud is that, uh, they were, uh, they ran pretty positive campaigns. They it didn't yeah. come into a sort of a negative slugfest, uh, and then the voters chose who they wanted to move forward. You know, they're both uh, le legislators, former legislators, and you can see from Matt's picture, he's a physician. That's pretty cool. He has mm -hmm. his stethoscope. Um, my understanding is that he is viewed in southern Arizona as the stronger of those two. He won, he, so he's proven himself stronger, but he's, he's, he's the one that, Democrats in south of the Gila thought had the best chance to unseat McSally. So it's probably not who McSally wanted to be running against. I was against. going to say, that's going to be close, right? Right, it is going to be close. And that's a, just like CD1, CD2 is a national district where there'll be national money. And, and speaking of CD1, I think we, the reason I was uh, hemming and hawing there, I think we skipped over the, there we go, the Democratic primary in District 1. Again, O'Halloran was expected to win. He has won. Can he beat Babu? Uh, absolutely. Um, I would actually, I, as a, I'm not a betting man, but where I would absolutely put my money on O'Halloran, and I'd say, number one, he is a guy who is a former police officer, he is a former Republican legislator, but a guy who sort of throughout his life has been a very independent voter, mm -hmm. and that's why he's kind of taken the positions that he has. And so he comes into this as a guy who has represented a large chunk of that district for a while as a Republican, uh, but now running as a, a Democrat, I, I just think his uh, you know reach on this is going to be yeah. very. He's good. got a lot going for him. I knew when he was in the legislature, and he was he was a very good legislator and a good campaigner. He's he's up against Babu, and Babu has all the charisma. And I mean, I don't think charismatic is how you describe Tom O'Halloran. He's certainly competent and a very decent individual. But Babu is a national, getting to be a national figure. And is when, he, when he's in a room, he dominates that room. And, and so it's going to be an, a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah, but he's got the baggage there. The I baggage. mean, they're and, not going to ignore that in a general election. <laughs> no, I'm quite confident they will not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, Gowan was the one saying he can't be elected yeah. in a general election. I, I mean, I think that that's not just a thrown out kind of thing. I, I think, think when, you know, David and I are both consultants here in Arizona and we, we have to live in this state, but there's gonna be a lot of out of state consultants with millions of dollars. Yes. And when they do the, sure. the, the biopsy on both candidates, they are gonna peel uh, Paul Babu's resume apart. And, and it's, it's gonna be a very awful to watch campaign. Is it going to be, are we going to see big money in both of these, CD1 and Congressional yeah, no District doubt, 2? No Huge doubt. You know, there's only, sides. there's, there's, you know, 435 districts in the country. There's, there's only a very small amount that are actual jump ball districts. We have two out of our nine. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a lot of money in Phoenix television for, for CD1. Outside yeah. money going to flood, huh? Oh, you bet. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I think that we've seen it in the history. I mean, the, the CD2 race has always been a big money uh, race. Uh, you know, when uh, we had Gabby Giffords there, or when we had Ron Barber there, it was always a race that became a big focus. It remains a focus. Same thing with this district that was represented by Ann Kirkpatrick. Always a big money race, uh, and it will be this time for sure. Corporation Commission, uh, we've got, looks like it's Burns, Tobin, and Dunn. 
Um, not necessarily the group that campaigned together, uh, but there they are, and uh, there they will go against the Democrats. First of all, uh, Stan, as far as this result, anything surprise you here at all? Well, I guess the, uh, the well, the answer is no. It didn't surprise me personally, but I think one of the interesting takeaways is those three that actually won the three seats were the three traditionally funded candidates none of whom had really any money. Right. Uh, and the other two that, that lost, Rick Gray and Al Melvin, former legislators, Rick Gray is a legislator, had uh, the public funding mechanism and they had you know, $100,000 each, yeah. which is really not enough to spend uh, to contact every voter, but at least they could you know, raise a pulse a little bit. And they came in fourth and fifth going away. So that's one of the interesting things. I yeah, think. What, what did you make out of all I, that? You know, I think that the Corporation Commission races are a fascinating thing to watch. I mean, you get from, if you are running clean, you get, as you say, you know, this 100,000, 125, or whatever it is, $1,000 that you get to spend. But you are talking to the entire state of Arizona. If you're running for governor, funded by the same mechanism, you're getting millions of dollars, right? So it's, it's just a very weird, it basically sets you up for nothing. Uh, you know, if you've got some name ID, if you've got some organization behind you, I think those are the things that uh, make a difference. Here's you know? the surprise of the election, and that is that Arizona Public Service, who is alleged to have spent millions of dollars two years ago, has spent evidently zero dollars this year. So far. So far. The, the general election <laughs> is coming up. But if they, if they were uh, looking to take Bob Burns out of the equation because he's most of their trouble at the current commission, they missed their opportunity because it's really in the primary where they could have done that. They haven't spent any money. Speculation on, in my world is that they're a little bit paralyzed by the investigation yes. going on by the U.S. attorney and the FBI, not to mention our own attorney general. And so they haven't spent any money. That's the interesting. So Burns, I, I'm, Burns versus APS helps Burns. He's a top vote getter in that primary. As far as going against Democrats, Bill Mundell, Tom Chapman, do, do those two have a chance now because of this, this APS brouhaha? Yeah, I think, you know, this is a race where, you know, again, absent something unusual, it f sort of defaults to party, uh, you know, party line voting, I think. But when something like this, something as big as this that has dominated news oftentimes begins to sort of percolate, um, I think that's where you begin to see the opportunity for the Democrats uh, to really make some headway. And I, I think that both of those guys are going to be worth watching. Here's, here's another phenomenon as well. Those, the two Democratic candidates both have clean elections funding. And if you put their primary money together with their general money, they have about $500,000 between them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's real. That you can actually start talking to voters with $500,000. The three Republicans we're going to have a hard time raising money because it's not the kind of office you can raise money for. And so the Democrat candidates will have more money hmm. than the Republican candidates. And they will campaign against APS yes, first, last, and always. Yes, they will. And they're, so far, the uh, folks that are most represented by the rooftop solar industry yes. have decided to spend a little money in this race. Now, they're not a monopoly. The commission doesn't decide what their profit margin is, but they do have business at the commission, and that's part of the, the controversy. County results uh, are Arpaio over Dan Saban. I don't think anyone's very surprised by this. It was a runaway, um, and it, as expected, Arpaio moves on. Now, Arpaio beats Saban handily. What about Paul Penzone in the matchup in the general election? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I actually believe that, uh, you know, Arpaio is sort of Trump-like in the sense that you never know what's going to stick and what's not. And in fact, many things don't. Uh, you know, here's a guy with a lot of, you know, investigations and scandals and, and all sorts of problems. Um, and to see him do this well in the primary was actually a little bit of a surprise for me. I, I mean, I still thought he would win. Uh, but I think that, you know, when, once you move on, it's again, in that Trump-like fashion, once you move on and face the general election where you have to talk to a whole different set of folks, mm -hmm. it becomes a different game. I think, yeah, I think there is Joe fatigue I really do. Now it's and he's he's been in office more than 20 years, he's, and he's cost you know on the right guys like me. I'm, I'm tired of the county paying out millions of dollars because of his actions, and that's starting to in, infect his base. Um, and you add to it the enthusiasm on the Democratic side, and I think he's really vulnerable in this election. And you got he beat Penzone by six points in a three-person race yes. last time. It's yes. a two-person race this time. Yes, it is. And I, I think our, our Democratic friends smell blood in this race, and, and I think they have reason. I think Penzone is a great candidate. 
And, but it's really a referendum on Arpaio. And as I say, I think there's a Arpaio fatigue. You know, you, I mean, you can't lie to a federal judge. You can't. You, I mean, and that's, that's cutting into his base yeah. as well. Um, mm -hmm. County Recorder Helen Purcell uh, looks like she is not going to be County Recorder anymore. Uh, very, very close race here. Uh, but what does this say about the voters? They were paying attention, weren't they? They were 100% paying attention. And that, you know, for anyone who is a uh, cynic or a doubter about, you know, voter participation, voter attention, uh, this is, I think, uh, you know, a refreshing, uh, you know, sign anyway that that voters were paying attention and they remembered when they got to the ballot box. You know, I think very clearly, clearly, this is a result of what happened on election yeah, day. Yeah, I feel bad for. I was elected to the state house in 1988, and so, so was Helen Purcell to her office. She's been in that same office the whole time. I've flamed out and joined the, <laughs> the dark say. side. Yeah. But the, the, she is a gracious woman who's actually done a great job for more than two decades. But it's always, what have you done for me lately? And, and the voters are still in charge. And half the people voting don't remember all the great things she's done. So that it, this is a big lesson in pol politics right here. And she took the mm -hmm. fall, whereas other politicians and other folks who might have yes. taken the fall from supervisors exactly. to the Secretary of State are still working. All right, uh, before we go, big winner, big loser last night. What do you got? Um, I would say um, I'm going to go with uh, Ann Kirkpatrick. I think that that night, uh, last night, I mean, obviously she didn't have a primary, but I think that the primary on the general side and just the, the voter turnout and the level of enthusiasm that we're seeing is a harbinger of good things for her in the uh, uh, general election. Got real quickly, you only got like 15 yeah, seconds. Yeah, so. Christine Jones is the big winner. She, she, she's going to be a congresswoman in as long as she wants. And the loser might be, as much as I like her, Michelle Reagan. She had a bad night. The Secretary yeah. of State's website crashed. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot. Of, it's, it's, it's kind of a tempest in the teacup, but she had a bad night. All right, gentlemen, good stuff. Good to have you both here. Thanks, Thanks for joining for us. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.